Thank, Thank you, you very Pierre. much. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. There's loads more people here than I was expecting. I thought everybody would be at the beach, but uh, it's really nice to, uh, to see so many people. I hope uh, you don't regret the decision halfway through the course of the lecture, because um, you're kind of a trapped audience now. But um, it's also a, a real honour to give the, the Sussex Development Lecture. I did my PhD here getting on for 20 years ago, and this lecture was always a, uh, a real high point of the week. It was something that, uh, that I always tried to get to and something that I saw an amazing array of speakers come through. So it's, uh, I'm very pleased to be given the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Uh, I'm going to use it to, rather than to present a, um, a, a classic paper, to think through a, a series of ideas that I've been working on recently. I want to use the, the opportunity of this, this very interesting theme around the links between humanitarianism and development to think about both of their effects on migration. Um, this relates to a couple of papers. I wanted to put up these references. Um, this is stuff um, coming out in the next few months. I seem to have spent the last three or four months writing papers in handbooks or readers and that kind of thing, which is, um, has certain advantages, um, but means that there's a, a range of quite general points that, um, that are made in that sort of, uh, sort of publication. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping in the next few months to draw some of these together into something with a bit more of a, a reasoned argument, and this talk is really the, uh, the first step in doing that. <coughs> but it draws on this kind of work that, uh, that you can see there. Um, as Priya said, I'm a, a political geographer. I'm particularly interested in borders and frontiers and the way that they are managed. Um, and migration as international migration, at least, as an attempt by individuals to cross those borders. Going back to the, the early 1980s, there was an understanding that the major paradigm that governed that relationship, the relationship between border control and people attempting to get across those borders, typically, although not always without authorization, was one of non-entree. The non-entree regime was the, uh, uh, the major focus from the mid-1980s onwards that state institutions, and, um, and I use states as a sort of collection of, of institutions that are, are often um, antagonistic to each other rather than as, as any sort of single idea, an effect of all of these um, antagonisms of different institutions. But states as a, as a collective um, were interested in stopping people getting across borders. That has changed in the intervening years really quite substantially, and the ways that political geographers have had to imagine borders has changed with it. So that rather than a, a non-entree regime, we're faced with a, a series of very complex patterns of deterrence. One of the, uh, the characteristics of, of being a refugee and your relationship with states is that that status is declaratory, it's not constitutive. That means that you are recognized as a refugee by a state because you already are a refugee. It's not the recognition that turns you into a refugee. And that's a very important distinction because it means that, that people in, in this kind of situation, this is the Greek-Macedonian border in March of 2016. And that, the fact that refugee status is declaratory, um, that you're, you're recognized as a refugee because you already are a refugee, means that people can come up to the, the border post here and say, I think I'm a refugee, I would like my status to be considered. That unleashes a, a range of obligations that any state which has signed the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees is obliged to go through. In some cases, these are quite lengthy, quite costly obligations. And it's this fact that has shifted the pattern from stopping states getting onto territory of wealthy, stopping individuals, sorry, getting onto the territory of wealthier states, to an attempt to stop individuals even reaching that territory. Individuals have certain 
rights, even at the edge of state territory, even in this situation at the very border, they can unleash certain obligations of states. And wealthier states are increasingly unwilling to allow them to do that. So that creates this very interesting, certainly for, for me and, uh, and political geographers more generally, a um, very interesting challenge that state institutions have to face, which is preventing non-nationals reaching the territory. That has been one of the overriding challenges of um, international migration policy in Western Europe, North America, other wealthy states over that period, over the last two or three decades. It hasn't been stopping people getting in, stopping people coming onto the territory of states. It has been stopping people even reaching the edge of that territory and stopping them having that ability to, to unleash those obligations. And this is difficult, clearly. States have a uh, a legitimate uh, monopoly over violence, to, to be Weberian for a moment, um, on their territory. But beyond that territory, they don't have that legitimate monopoly of violence. They can't just grab people and stop them. They, their coercion is much more limited. So beyond state territory, in an extraterritorial context, it's very difficult to force people to do what you want them to do. So that form of coercion has to be significantly less. And there's a range of ways in which state institutions have attempted to do that. And what I want to talk about today is the use of development and humanitarianism to do so. Development and humanitarianism is one of those opportunities in which state institutions regularly engage with often quite large numbers of people on the territory of other states non-nationals, not nationals of, not of the state which is providing the development funding. So that provides a significant opportunity to imagine the ways in which development can stop migration or can affect migration in some way. The argument that I want to go through is, uh, is in five stages. Um, firstly, <coughs> that the positive impact of migration on development is well established and widely recognised. That's something which I will largely assume um, and I think that is supported by a very significant amount of evidence. A lot of it has been gathered in centres like uh, Migrating Out of Poverty, the centre that uh, Priya is research director of here at Sussex. Um, which has contributed more than, than many other uh, research programs towards establishing that. That's very widely accepted. It's now the basis of a whole range of, of global um, programs around migration and development which seek to, uh, to capitalise on this potential positive impact that migration can have on development processes. So it's really two, three and four, the points that I want to, uh, to try and argue. Because the converse is not nearly so clearly established. The impact of migration on development, very broad agreement, largely positive, at least in certain circumstances. Um, the impact of development on migration is much more uncertain, um, much more politically contested and increasingly manipulated um, to support this idea of deterrence through migration policy. Um, and it's that element that I really want to focus on and that element that, that I've become particularly interested in. So this fits in a, in a broad post-development framework, the idea that, that donor states use um, official development assistance for their own interests. That is um, not particularly controversial, I don't think, particularly not in, in this institution, which in many ways has contributed towards that sort of post-development context, and that now forms a part of the, of the fundamentals of a lot of, of the stuff which is taught here and, uh, and at the university. So I'm particularly interested in the use of development and humanitarian aid to stop migration. What evidence is there that this is happening? And particularly at point three, I want to argue that that has moved from a preventative root cause approach. An interest in the root causes of migration can be traced back to the early 1980s, possibly before that. But this suggests an idea of using, using development aid to stop 
the things which encourage people to move, so to address the drivers of migration. And that, as I said, is relatively well established, and we can see quite a lot of evidence for that. Over the last few decades, um, using a, quite an interesting form of analysis from, uh, from Ana López Sala, um, she's looked at ways in which the Spanish government, this is a 2015 article, ways in which the Spanish government uses um, a whole range of tools to stop migration. And she categorizes those as preventative, coercive, and repressive. And for her, development is firmly within that preventative range of, um, of tools that governments have. That means that it's, it's something which is conducted beyond the territory of the state which is funding it. So the, the opportunities for coercion are very limited. Um, she looks at two other forms of action. Um, coercive forms of action, which are um, much more direct attempts to control what is going on um, in, in other states. And repressive, which are clearly physically violent forms of action that involve physically stopping individuals moving. And she suggests that this is to be found between territories, often in maritime operations, for example. Um, and I want to suggest that the use of development aid is moving from this preventative root cause approach to a set of ideas where development aid is being used to fund or support or legitimize these more coercive or even explicitly violent activities to prevent migration. Uh, and the most recent stage of this, at, um, at point four, is the recognition of multiple border crises that have been, particularly we can date to, uh, to April 2015, um, where the language of crisis, to, to indicate something both exceptional and bad, has been used to, to legitimate an increasing use of humanitarian aid at borders. Um, Bring, bring, building on uh, analysis by William Walters, a, a classic paper from 2011 around the development of the humanitarian border. And the, the final conclusion that, um, that I will get to in uh, half an hour or so, um, mm. that this process undermines public support for development and humanitarianism, which is perhaps not particularly large anyway, and exacerbates public opposition to migration, which is particularly high at the moment within Western Europe. So this isn't good for development, humanitarianism, or migration, and I think that's why we should be concerned about it. So to start, the idea that development can be used to prevent migration is a very, very old one. Um, and it's, it's usually traced back to, to colonial ideas, that migration is a product of underdevelopment. If migration is a product of underdevelopment, then logically development will stop people migrating. And this is building on work particularly by, uh, by Alan Lester, for example, our colleague in the geography department, who looks at the, uh, the colonial origins of the contemporary humanitarian system. The cartoon is, uh, is from Punch in, uh, in 1830, and, uh, and it actually illustrates the value of migrating from London, and the, uh, the cartoon on the left is here, as in London, and uh, the there on the, uh, on the right is New Zealand. Um, this is uh, developing the idea. At the bottom, I don't know if, uh, actually you can't because it's just off the screen. Uh, the cartoon is called Emigration a Remedy, and the suggestion of, uh, of this, this work is that the widespread vagrancy that London was experiencing in the early 19th century could be solved, maybe could even lead to directly to significant migration where on the right everybody would be leading happy heteronormative lives around the, uh, the table, carving up the, uh, the roast meat in the, uh, in the afternoon. Um, so migration was the, the, the solution from getting to the picture on the left to the, to the picture on the right. And this is a, a classic image in which migration was seen throughout the, certainly um, there's plenty of evidence of this uh, throughout the British Empire and, uh, and perhaps more widely as well, that migration resulted from poverty, despondency, desperation. So resolving that 
somehow addressing those, those issues of, of poverty and desperation would stop people migrating. That was a fairly, a fairly clear pattern. And that um, approach can be followed all the way through to the, uh, the early 1970s when the, uh, we can see the origins of, uh, of movements in France, for example, around co-development, the, uh, the system of aide au retour that was introduced in, uh, in France in 1973. This is a, a more recent uh, illustration of, uh, of aide au retour that explicitly connected development aid with migration objectives of returning people, getting people out of France uh, at the time because they were unemployed, France didn't want them, their temporary migration status has ended for whatever reason. The, the migration objective of deportation and expulsion was explicitly linked within the policy of, of co-development to development support. And in this graphic, you can see a, uh, a more contemporary argument for doing that. Um, at the top, expulsions. The, uh, the illustrations are a prison plus a plane and a security guard plus a, um, a magistrate or some sort of uh, legal system um, was reckoned, and this is an approximate uh, uh, figure, uh, somewhere around 20,000 euros. Um, at the bottom, a voluntary return. The, uh, the plane without the security guard, significantly in that illustration, plus money, plus what uh, is seen as some form of possibly agricultural work, I guess, at the bottom right there. Um, the cost of that, approximately 2,000, plus 5,000 for the individual to, to develop some sort of productive development activity. That continues um, very significantly in Western Europe. The... Uh, the only distinction with contemporary systems which are usually referred to as, uh, as AVR or AVRR, Assisted Voluntary Return and Reintegration, um, is that they target individuals who don't have a legal right to be in Europe. The, uh, the initial Edouard schemes in the, uh, the early 1970s in France, later Germany and the Netherlands, were targeted at individuals who were legally resident. They were just unemployed. Um, voluntary return um, targets individuals who are not legally resident. They may have come to the end of an asylum claim. They may simply be undocumented. And the, the 5,000 euros, it varies from country to country. The UK uses anywhere between 1,500 and 4,000 pounds to, to encourage this, is intended as a... Um, uh, an incentive for individuals to return, but also as a, a legitimation element to support return which otherwise might not be publicly palatable in a liberal democracy. There is relatively widespread opposition in most liberal democracies to uh, certainly forced returns. So this makes forced returns a little more palatable, though in many cases they're, they're still pretty forced. I gave a paper a couple of years ago called Assisted Voluntary Returns, Neither Assisted Nor Voluntary Nor Return, question mark, that, um, that is, is captured in the, the 2018 paper in the, the post-deportation book that, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so this idea that development can stop migration is still very significantly present across uh, migration policy, development policy in most wealthy states, in most donor states. This is a, a significant and indeed growing basis for deciding on development aid. The big problem behind this is, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, development doesn't reduce migration. And this is now very well established. I want to go through a couple of, of graphs very briefly that illustrate this. But this is, um, any of you who have looked at this will, will not find this surprising. So um, if you know this, excuse the, uh, the overview. This um, term, the migration hump, it says at the beginning, um, this is um, from work that, uh, that Phil Martin, an agricultural economist at the University of California, did in the early 90s around NAFTA and around the impact that NAFTA would have on migration. And this is clearly schematic, but the basic idea of it is, uh, is an interesting one. This is um, level of development across the bottom and international migration across the top. And, uh, and his argument was that at, at very low levels of development, people don't really have the, uh, the resources to do, to do very much. 
Um, so migration is very limited. As development increases, get to a certain threshold where people start to have the money to, to move. They start to have the money to buy plane tickets, to buy travel tickets, to, to move around. They also, increasingly, um, have the, the money for other things like education, which broadens their horizons, makes them interested in other parts of the world, and makes them want to go there. And then eventually internet and satellite TV and it, uh, these, this access to the rest of the world encourages an interest in going there. And then you get to a, a certain point, um, which is reckoned to be somewhere around the level of development of Tunisia or Thailand, that sort of thing, where increasing development starts to, to decrease international migration. And in wealthy countries, international migration is actually much lower. And in Western Europe and uh, North America, this is what we find, that people actually don't want to move around that much. Um, so that's the sort of schematic version. Um, that dates from the early, early mid-90s. Uh, in more recent work, uh, Michael Clements, who's uh, at the Centre for Global Development, started to put actual numbers into this. He used um, World Bank uh, census data on the, on the left and uh, similar census data from the, from the UN on the right, which are managed in slightly different ways. Um, and you can see this, uh, this pattern developing more and more clearly as we get to the 2000 and 2010 um, census rounds, that, um, that this, this hump, as GDP per capita increases up to a certain level, which in, in both graphs is round about $6,000 a year, um, migration increases with increasing GDP per capita. And this was a very important finding. And, um, and it really um, underlies the, the futility of continuing to use development and humanitarian aid as tools to, to prevent migration. So this is pretty robust evidence, getting on for as robust as we could expect within the social sciences for something, for a pattern in this way. So it's not surprising that looking back about a decade or so ago large institutions working on migration and development programs began to recognize this this is uh, Benito Ferreira Waldner who in 2006 was European Commissioner for External Relations and the European Neighborhood Policy and in 2006 the, the European Union released what was then called the Global Approach to Migration. It's now called the Global Approach to Migration and Mobility, the GAM. Um, and Farrow Waldener described that process um, in, in very clear terms, distancing it from what she saw as previous uh, undertakings within the migration and development field. So she, de she describes it as a policy more in keeping with today's world. It takes us away from more development for less migration to better managing migration for more development. Of course, for many people, that's a largely semantic distinction since uh, in a lot of Western Europe, better managing migration means less migrants. So it's, it's not a, uh, perhaps as substantial a difference as, uh, as she is presenting in that way. But nonetheless, there's at least a rhetorical um, recognition that the way that previous policies within Western Europe had been understanding this relationship was flawed in some way. That, um, that it, is, it is problematic to, uh, to try to use development in these ways simply to stop migration. Unfortunately, one of the, the things which has happened over the, the course of the migration crisis is that people have forgotten this. Priti Patel... Um, within uh, a month of, uh, of being appointed uh, UK Minister for International Development, used an article in the Daily Mail to, to make the sort of argument that you would expect to be made in the Daily Mail, um, saying, I want to use our aid budget to directly address the great global challenges that affect the UK, like creating jobs in poorer countries, so as to reduce the pressure for mass migration to Europe. So there's this return to an idea that, that development aid can be used to, to prevent migration, that the root cause approach really does work. During um, Priti Patel's tenure, 
at, uh, at DFID. Um, Priya and I were involved in discussions about a, a very large call that uh, the DFID had put out. It was uh, a project in Ethiopia, um, 25 million pounds, of which the, uh, the research component was a very attractive 2 million pounds. And the, uh, the, la the larger project was focused at livelihood, generating livelihood opportunities in Ethiopia. And the research component was to identify whether 20,000 individuals reported outcomes related to this program as a reason for not migrating. That was the only evaluation of the program. But 20,000 people had to report program-related outcomes as a reason for not migrating. Nothing about... Did it create good livelihood opportunities? Um, this was funding explicitly directed at stopping people moving from Ethiopia. It ended up being withdrawn, I think for very good reasons. We were very relieved that, uh, that this, uh, this wasn't a, uh, uh, a tenure, uh, a tending opportunity that, uh, that we could, uh, could get engaged with. But um, this sort of thing, the idea that, that Stopping migration alone is enough to, to justify the, the evaluation of certain programs really underlines this, um, this sort of approach, which really characterizes the notion of preventative dissuasion within migration. This idea that migration control can be used uh, to, to address the causes that make people migrate and therefore stop that migration. So the first of these three areas that I want to talk about is development as preventative control. One of the areas where this has been developed um, is through regional consultative processes, um, largely voluntary um, processes in which states um, are not obliged to participate. They send individuals for, for discussions which are significantly off the record, um, can be quite high level, and aren't binding, crucially. Um, there are two global processes operating at the moment, the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which happens every year, and the, the High Level Dialogue on International Migration and Development, which has happened in 2006 and 2013 and is likely to happen again at some stage in the future. Um, those two focus exclusively on migration and development, as their names suggest. Um, and more recently, the, uh, the Global Compact on Migration developed these kind of ideas further. So this is uh, an area of really intense, frequent, high-level, but informal discussions. Um, beyond the global processes, there are 17 intra-regional uh, regional consultative processes uh, and 15 regional RCPs. Now of those 32, five of those are exclusively focused on migration and development. So there's an amazing set of, of activities, uh, of discussions at a pretty high level. Um, the, the European Union is engaged in regional consultative processes um, with, with 13 of the, the real target countries in North and West Africa. They are collectively involved in three different consultative processes, some of which meet every year. So there are opportunities at least three or four times a year to discuss these sorts of issues largely off the record. And this is a, a classic area of norm development. Ideas such as safe migration and the way in which we understand safe migration have evolved through these regional consultative processes so that there is now a very clear set of understandings that safe migration means legal migration, that illegal migration cannot be safe under any circumstances by definition. It's that sort of normative development of understanding which has continually evolved throughout these largely informal uh, relationships. <coughs> and there's two further developments which really help to, to legitimise this um, uh, self-evident use of development as preventative control. Firstly, the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. The previous Millennium Development Goals were uh, lamented for their failure to, uh, to recognise the significance of migration. There was no mention of, uh, of migration within the Millennium Development Goals. The, the SDGs are not a lot better to be honest, of the 169 sub-goals, only one, 
uh, is explicitly focused on migration. There are another seven or eight that you can get to which mention migration in some way or other. And, uh, and if you take a relatively broad idea, you can get to almost half of them as being related to migration in some way or other. But 10.7 is the only one which is solely and explicitly focused on migration. And of the 169, I think this has to be the worst of the lot. Um, I'll read it out. Um, 10.7 is uh, to facilitate the orderly, safe and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. This is when people are sitting down to, to try to work out how they're going to start to measure the SDGs. Some of them are obviously linked into very regularly collected data and can be monitored very easily. Some of them, they've got kind of an idea how to, uh, how to start to measure them. And then there's a third category with absolutely no idea how you can start to get indicators on that. And this one obviously falls into that third category. <laughs> the, the second and, uh, and final um, set of, of ideas that I want to talk about is around this notion of the humanitarian border, where humanitarian aid itself is used as a way of preventing migration. The, um, the humanitarian border has developed, it's not a, a universal development, but at particular points around the world that William Walters referred to, refers to as frontiers of poverty. These are situations in which, across a single border, there is a very dramatic difference in lifestyle, GDP per capita, access to welfare, etc. Um, and, and at these borders across the Mediterranean, the, uh, the US-Mexico border, further into Central America, increasingly at the Guatemalan-Mexican border, and in the waters around Australia, um, the, the loss of life that we've seen over the last, going back uh, 15 or 20 years, but particularly concentrated in the last five years, has been really exceptional and really um, highlighted these movements as areas of humanitarian concern. There is clearly a humanitarian interest in preventing people dying at the borders of Europe and North America. One of the ways in which that prevention has occurred is not through what, what I call in one of these articles disingenuous development, um, through a use of development assistance not simply to support those individuals, to provide some sort of solution to that movement, but actually to prevent that migration. And Walters, in this, uh, this really classic article of 2011, talks about the humanitarian borders holding together in an uneasy alliance the politics of alienation, an idea that these individuals should be prevented, should be kept away from the borders, with the politics of care. And he draws very significantly on Didier Fassin's work around notions of humanitarianism as identifying the victim, um, that uh, the humanitarianism um, requires or involves a gift to which there can be no counter-gift in fascinating ways. Um, so Walters describes it as a tactic of objection and one of reception, a combination of, almost paradoxical combination of these two. And to go into slightly more detail, essentially this involves camouflaging forms of control as humanitarian intervention. In a, an article just published by Letty Moreno Lax, talks about two strategies that are uh, essential to the humanitarian order. Um, firstly, rescue through interdiction, in which she identifies a range of ideas in which the fact that individuals had been prevented from moving is seen as a humanitarian objective because they hadn't put themselves at risk. Um, so, Simply the fact that they were interdicted, they were prevented from moving, is a form of rescue in terms of the Frontex documents that she um, analyzes. And secondly, a, uh, a form of rescue where individuals are literally taken out of boats <coughs> without any form of protection. So a rescue leading not to um, sub subsequent protection and support within the European Union, but leading to a fairly rapid uh, review of, uh, of individual situations and a rapid subsequent return, such as in the, the case of agreements between Italy and Libya more recently. The other element of this, where these sorts of humanitarian activities are carried out by non-state agents, I mentioned Saint Frontier, for example, has a boat which controls the Mediterranean, is, as, uh, as many of you will be aware, the criminalization of this solidarity, the, the charging of individuals who are engaged in these sorts of perhaps more genuinely humanitarian forms of rescue with 
crimes that are legitimated through anti-trafficking infrastructure. I'm running out of time, so um, I will leave it there for, for that. But I just want to, to conclude, um, as I started, that, that these cases, the use of both development and humanitarian support uh, is increasing. It's becoming um, more widely recognized. There is clearly political will to, to do this. There are very substantial, widespread forms of legitimation of these, uh, these tools through the, uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals, through the uh, increasingly flexible use of, uh, of ODA, um, through the use of humanitarian aid legitimated by the, the clear humanitarian crisis occurring at Borden. But, as I said at the beginning, this undermines public faith in development, it undermines public faith in humanitarianism, neither of which are particularly strong anyway, and it only acts to increase the alienation of migrants. So all three of these are things which I think we should reject and highlight this as a, a particularly problematic concerning development. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. other agendas and how it's becoming increasingly difficult to separate the two and like you say it is undermining our faith in development assistance which is obviously a bad thing. So I'd like to open the floor now for questions. We have just over half an hour if, if it is to end at half past six. So please be brief and uh, let's have questions rather than comments if possible. And do briefly identify yourself as well. So, any questions? Looks like everyone's in agreement with what you said. <laughs> Ideas of a what a politics of care looks like. 
that goes into questions of solidarity in much more detail. But wherever you find these, um, these situations of even quite violent opposition, there are tremendously strong acts of solidarity, as those in the very well. Um, and I'm looking at more detail about the organisation of those acts of solidarity, the strategy, the way they develop. Um, that's that's one, one possibility of looking at the sort of responses. The other um, really interesting theoretical area is around the autonomy of migration that uh, we again I didn't talk about, but I'm trying to write some stuff about at the moment. Um, which is a, a set of ideas almost in opposition to this, this clear objection of, of migrants and victims that highlights the fact that um, the migration, not individual migrants, but migration as a whole, has a degree of autonomy which goes beyond attempts to control them. But attempts to control migration are usually <coughs> unsuccessful in one way or another. Um, in some cases, they might stop a particular movement across a particular border, but the result is that that is transferred somewhere else. So, so people eventually uh, are able to, uh, to to get to the place that they want to do. The argument that uh, the answer to a 50-foot wall is a 51-foot ladder kind of uh, uh, thing. That, um, so that focus on the, the inevitability of migration, despite these increasingly violent forms of control, is another slightly more positive. Um, and now could, yes, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm not claiming that all of this is radically new. Um, even the, the widespread use of, of humanitarianism to justify things that we certainly wouldn't consider to be humanitarian under any normal circumstances that is a good one. Um, some of the work I was doing in Sri Lanka um, towards the end of the conflict there in 2009, the government described the, um, the operation which ended up killing, in a conservative estimate, 40,000 civilians as a humanitarian operation because it was going to liberate them from the, the yoke of the, uh, the LTTE. So the use of, of humanitarianism to legitimate things which really aren't humanitarianism is, obviously has a long and unfortunate history to it. Um, but I think the the ways in which this is being legitimated using highly respected global tools, like the SDGs, I think that is a, a relatively new development. Um, similarly, the, the contesting of the definition of, uh, of official development systems is, again, has a long history to it, that um, the ODA is notoriously flexible in the way it's defined. But this particular increase in the use of in-donor um, assistance is, um, uh, I think, highlights uh, another relatively new trend. And perhaps another response to this in terms of what the, what the future holds, um, the, the report from last year that, that I showed that highlighted how, other than, than infantry in-donor refugee assistance, there's no statistical breakdown of um, the use of ODA to, to engage migrants or migration in any way. So it's, it's only anecdotal that the geography of, of ODA sending is shifting in relation to migration, that, uh, that migration objectives are becoming integrated into, into ODA. There's no clear way of measuring or monitoring that. And, and I think no, that would be relatively easy. The OECD could do that. They could change their reporting rules. That required um, donor countries to, to provide some sort of account of that. And that, like the, this is relatively recent, it's the last year or so, that the awareness of, of in-donor refugee costs and how they have become such a large proportion of certain states' budget. And the Austrian government is embarrassed by this, politically. And having the statistics to embarrass governments is a, is a useful thing to have. So that sort of accounting, statistical process, they're important in that way because they can be used to, to gather that sort of information that can then be used to, to highlight the fact that if Austria is spending 40% of its ODA budget in Austria, it's not really ODA. And that can be, that's a powerful political tool. And if we had similar political tools for the use of um, 
programs to that are evaluated solely by their effects at stopping migration, then that would have a similar um, political use, I think, to try to, to respond to this. And at the moment we don't have that. So that, that would be a relatively easy thing that the OECD could do to start to address that. Yes. Um, right. One more here. And here. Hello. Can I just ask it here? Um, you mentioned at the beginning about post-development. I'm Jill, by the way, I'm an undergraduate in global studies, so excuse me, naivety of my question. But do you suppose that we change, you see a future for development and the development paradigm? And I'm, I'm assuming from the way that we talk, we're thinking about reconstructing it and changing it, because with all the what you're saying now, and we know many much, much, much more about the development that it's flawed and it's not really working. My mind would go just scrap it, but we're saying about transforming it so that it does become efficient. But is that possible? And you know, with the power relations, is that really possible? I'm just curious. Good afternoon. My name is Loxanne Harley. I work with the International Organization for Migrations Regional Office in Brussels. Uh, I just had a question about the progressive aspect of development projects that you were talking about. I was particularly interested in the point you made about the program in Ethiopia, the DIFID program, where they included uh, initially at least an indicator on I don't know how, how they formulated it, but um, an indicator on how it prevented migration. I was just wondering whether, in, in your review of possible review of other um, donor projects and programs, whether you had come across other um, monitoring frameworks where they had actually uh, integrated some kind of indicators in, in that regard. From my knowledge, I've been mean, my friend making waves and um, I've spoken with Anna Noll as well. Like, I, I didn't think it had actually, the whole root causes debate, I didn't think the whole root causes debate had actually led to big changes in the act, act, what was actually happening in those projects you know, what was, and what was being measured, but I'd be interested in, in what you um, come across. Yeah, I'll just take that one. Increasingly worried about the professionalization and appropriation of solidarity, both as a means and as an idea by big institutions and by states. And we are currently witnessing the, as you said, the criminalization of solidarity, especially in Greece with the new anti terrorism laws and the increasing violence we face every day in the streets, both as Greeks and the refugees and the migrants, and I was and I was wondering if you have a solution or at least a response to that of, of how to take back um, solidarity as a state of being in the everyday and decentralizing power from the states and institutions that adopt a rhetoric, a very legal, legalistic rhetoric that has been constructed in a way that is not understandable by most people on purpose. So yeah, that's my question of how to take back control of the centralized power in order to help our fellow people across the Mediterranean that are coming, where all the Mediterranean has basically turned into a massive grave, which is disgusting in my opinion. So yeah, that's my question. Great. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, the first one, Joe, is the biggest, I think, not the uh, <laughs> best place to, uh, to answer that necessarily, but uh, whether development has any future at all. And inevitably, there's a lot of inertia in, in development. Um, the, I think the, the post-development thesis is simply that, um, that donor states have very clear interests in providing the aid they do. Um, that, um, that's usually traced back to people like Arturo Escobar and um, work analysing the, the justification for particular forms of, of aid. This is a, a small part of that, that um, where the 
the interest in providing development is in, uh, in preventing migration. Um, in practical terms, I don't think development is necessarily going to stop. And, and clearly, there are plenty of examples where it, it does a lot of positive good. I don't want to suggest that development is, is only, only negative. Um, certainly, all of the development professionals I know are interested in, in enacting that, that positive good, and, um, and they are successful now and again. And I don't think many of them would make any claims that they were successful more than now and again, and that would be considered a reasonably good, good result. Um, one of the, the arguments within the migration and development literature is that in certain contexts, the migrants themselves are the most knowledgeable and the best connected in terms of, of spending on the development need. And there are moves to, to funnel certain forms of development assistance through migrant associations, for example. Um, there's an awful lot, I do quite a lot of research in Morocco, and there's a, an awful lot of examples where um, Moroccan migrant associations in Europe have been very successful at uh, gaining support and have provided you know, road building, electrification, local hospitals in parts of rural Morocco. And it's good. There's no, no getting away from it, but there's, there's a lot of positive stuff there. So that's, it's not that, that development is a, is a big, bad, unchanging edifice. People working within development are as conscious of this sort of post-development critique as uh, people working outside of it. And, um, and I think there is a, um, a frustration amongst many and a, um, and a desire to do something about it. Um, and provide, I see the role of this sort of presentation as a, a critical voice as providing material and awareness that will support people to be conscious of that. If they go into development work, I'm not saying to people you know, turn your back on development and forget about it, but, um, but there are concerning aspects to it. Um, in terms of the, the ways in which this is having the preventative development, it's a really interesting question. Um, whether it's having direct measurable impacts on the ground. Um, the, the Making Ways report, I think, was interesting because it, it showed significant variability between countries. So Sweden and Denmark, for example, the increase in, in donor refugee assistance resulted in a fall in out-of-country refugee assistance. Um, but as a whole, the European Union didn't experience that. So even though there was a doubling in, in donor refugee assistance, the overall increase in ODA was such that um, there was still uh, significantly more. So there was there was no additionality there. It wasn't that um, that Indonesian refugee assistance was funded by taking money away from um, the uh, program down to the country. Um, so there was variability within the country. The situation like the different program where programs are evaluated solely on the basis of preventing migration. And that's the only example that I, I actually know, and, and it was withdrawn later, um, partly because it would be incredibly difficult to do. Um, there are examples from internal migration, which I think right. mentioned later. Um, I mean, if you think of development assistance, um, within countries as well, that is often aimed at reducing migration uh, too. And I can think of examples from India, like watershed development programs or rural employment generation programs, which do have um, one, of, I mean, one of the objectives that they have is to reduce migration, rural urban migration. Many southern governments are very heavily biased against rural urban migration. And it does threaten their kind of development paradigm, what they understand development to mean and what they see, how they see migration fitting into that. So migration is a failure of development and therefore a lot of development assistance is aimed at keeping people in their place and, and preventing migration. So certainly with internal migration, there are many examples of that. And the final question on solidarity, um, again, it's a really important one, that 
that to some extent addresses the overall negativity of, of these sorts of presentations that, um, that I try to avoid. Usually. Um, but, and we have colleagues in geography working on, on issues like conviviality and how conviviality is, is generated, um, how solidarity at a micro scale develops between individuals in the context of civil society organisations, neighbourhood organisations. Um, and I think it's that sort of ethnographic micro scale which is, which is needed to really understand those sorts of relations because they're relations between individuals. When it comes to, to more international relations, geopolitical questions, um, it's more difficult to, to identify those sorts of movements, except in the context of, um, um, of NGO or civil society action which is criminalised. And issues of solidarity at an international relations perspective. Solidarity is the, the name which is now given to what was previously called burden sharing. And um, the burden being refugees in most cases. And, uh, and because that, that label was criticised, solidarity is what the, the European Union referred to in relation to the Dublin Convention, for example, which allocates responsibility for, uh, for certain uh, examining um, asylum claims. So, so I think the a focus on, on micro scale responses is the way in which something can be best understood. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, David Rubiani. I'm pre previous PhD from Global Studies, uh, currently uh, teaching fellow at the University of Birmingham. Um, my question is about uh, the issue of deportation as a development tool, or do you know how deportation has been developmentalized, if you like, because I noticed one of your papers at the beginning of the presentation alluded to that. And I think, I guess, um, following the outrageous scandal of uh, deporting, deporting Commonwealth citizens, potentially um, as a result of the um, hostile environment policy, uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how deportation has been included within a kind of development framework. Because one of the things from what has emerged is that deportees have been receiving, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if it's DFID, have been funding local NGOs and countries which have been receiving deported people as part of, and justifying that as part of their kind of development assistance. So could you expand on that a little bit and perhaps reflect a little bit on the Current kind of scandal that's been unfolding in the UK. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much, uh, Stephen, research officer here. Um, I, Professor, I don't really know much about migration as a study, but you piqued my interest because you mentioned a lot of programs around youth employment and entrepreneurship, which is my area. Um, and it made me think about kind of the language around prevention and this like politics of care. And from the way that I view my work is that the programs that are being positioned by the state is a very supply side to my human capital is the solution you can be your own maker of your well-being and so i was wondering if that and there's very little kind of evidence that actually promotes stability for people in communities um, and i was just wondering whether or not that's a ticking time bomb around kind of what is the role state in prevention um, and kind of whether or not there's this element in development discourse of the responsabilization of people's well-beings through these supply side things that don't actually have an impact as much as we proclaim that they should be. I was wondering if, whether or not if that's the case and it looks like there's much toward that direction what you may think in where the politics of coercion and that uh, would go with that. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak about a bit about the kind of the language of prevention in, and the role of the state and where we are now and whether or not that actually has an implication for migration politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, those two 
to, to David's question on um, deportation. Um, and there's, there's two elements to this, as that graphic suggested. There's deportation as in forced removal, people being taken out in handcuffs, put on the plane, taken home, um, who don't get anything at all in terms of development system. Um, and then there is the, the ADR style process, which I'm sick of. And, um, and there is a choice involved. Um, I interviewed a migration control officer once who said, even if the choice is with the handcuffs or without the handcuffs, it's still a choice. Um, it's a limited choice in that context. And, um, and one of the critiques of both programs is the voluntariness. The uh, ECRA, the European Council of Refugees and Exile, recommends that um, AVR programs should be referred to as return, mandatory return with consent. Um, program that, um, that for many of them is a, is a more accurate term. Um, some of the research I did in Trinidad was with people who had been returned under those programs. And some of them were, were very happy. You know, some of them were, were delighted that they had a few thousand pounds to spend on, on the budget. They were going to return anyway. Um, they, were, um, they were happy to have the money. Um, and it, it made that return easier. But in many cases, it would have been more difficult. Although that was the minority in that case. And the difficulty is that the ADR programs operate in situations like Sri Lanka, when I was doing that work from 2006 to 2009, which were highly fragile politically, often very violent. Um, there are ADR programs all over the world, most of them to situations that produce refugees, where they have active conflicts going on. It's difficult to turn into a place with an active conflict going on. Um, so there are, on an individual basis, that's a, a very difficult and, and challenging thing to do, to provide people with some support in the context. Um, I think broader research around that suggests that that, that money doesn't provide any incentive at all that mostly these programs attract people who would have returned anyone. Um, but, um, but there's there's another set of arguments around a, um, a more collective use of development aid to support people. I, I've not done the work directly, but, uh, but I you know of, uh, of work with people who've been returned to Senegal, where there's a significant expenditure of of development aid in order to to ensure things like individual employment and uh, with an effort to sort of anchor those people in, in place. Um, that, that in some ways starts to, to address Stephen's um, question. I'm not entirely sure how to how to make that link except the the idea that uh, the sort of neoliberal classic notion that individuals are responsible for their own development. Um, that comes through in some of those entrepreneurial programs or, or youth empowerment programs. Um, I think the link with migration is in that context where individuals are returned and then provided with some sort of program which is designed to, um, to ensure that, that their future migration is, is unlikely. Um, although in, in many contexts, their future migration is particularly challenging anyway because they would have to raise such a lot of money to, uh, to, to actually get back. Um, certainly their future migration at a, an international level. Um, but, um, but the sort of individual graduate support programs um, that, are, that are provided to returnees in that case, I think, are, are perhaps where those issues would, would coincide with with your work, and, that's, uh, and there are plenty of examples of those where this individualised approach, I think, is, is very definitely apparent. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I think we should discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'll finish off with, with a question um, myself, if that's all right. Um, uh, yeah, when I was listening to you speaking, I was just wondering if Anyone's actually looked into the connection between the continued popularity and the survival of the root causes of growth and the, the refusal to accept the 
inevitability of migration. Sorry, I'm not coming to either. And um, and the kind of institutional structure that is very powerful in supporting agriculture and rural development. Because in my world, um, I do come across that quite a lot. So, so the CG system and all the associated organizations find migration extremely threatening to their raison d'etre. You know, they want to tell the world that agriculture and rural development is really the route to development, and that's what people should be doing. And they also see migration as a failure of development, and therefore they feel that it's something that needs to be countered. And I feel that there may be an intersection somewhere between those sorts of agendas and um, forces and what you're describing as well, you know. It's like there is that kind of undercurrent as well. And I wondered if anyone's actually looked at that and, and traced that process. It certainly comes up all the time in, in development policy, especially with the sort of internal and regional migration that I deal with a lot, where there is that kind of connection being made all the time between agriculture and rural development and, and migration and the need to rein in people, you know, and stop leaving agriculture. And it's a very firmly held belief. It's very difficult to actually budge people. Right? I mean, if you start to say anything different, then they start to find ways of not listening to what you have to say. So I just wonder if it is something that you can look at. It's not something I've looked at. But I mean, it's a really interesting question. Mm. Um, but it is something that returns again and again as a fundamental element of, uh, of ways of addressing it. Um, and I think root cause approaches are, certainly for politicians, they provide an apparently relatively easy, straightforward way of responding to migration. Maybe some people think that it's going to work, some people are just satisfied with the fact that it looks like they're doing something. Um, I think there's a, a number of people, and I, I know a number of people in this case, where we put in this category, who are conscious that it's not going to work, but see it as a way of increasing development funding to certain projects that they're very interested in. Um, for, for very good reasons, I think. And the, the argument I was trying to make here is that that is also a dangerous process to, to get into. Um, and there are other people who are very critical of it, like, like me, but I wouldn't see, I mean, root causes work over a 50 or 60 year period. That's the, the trouble is that, that they're, they're set into political contexts which don't have that degree of time. That, um, the part, on the one hand, we argue that um, that migration is a violent experience, that um, the people prefer to be at home in general, and certainly when you look at that migration hunt graph, when people get into a situation of, of relative comfort, of security, where they're living in states that, that are wealthy, where they have freedom to choose, people tend not to migrate, um, because people like being where they are. Um, in general terms, um, at least they, they go on holiday for a couple of weeks and then they come back again. Um, so that that characteristic can't work against an argument saying that root causes approaches are always in effect. And ultimately, they are effective because they improve people's lives and they mean that, that they can stay where they want to be. Um, but it's just that, that that needs more than a four-year time span or a three-year time span to understand the most most projects. So the projects don't have a measurable impact on those sorts of decisions. I think that's the that's the paradox of root cause approaches, that they are they're designed of their plan in time frames which are completely unrealistic given that. And that is if people do want to stay there. Yeah. I mean that could be again something that I come across in more and more work where people really want to shed off that old skin of an old identity and an old way of living and become a different person, you know, so they really don't want to say what they are. And I guess you get all kinds of you know, situations. Um, okay, well, thank you very, very much for an extremely rich discussion and wonderful presentation. And thank you all for coming. And um, that's all. We've got another. We've got a slide at the end. Oh, right, yes.
the next lecture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.